Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey everyone, it's uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee again here with another episode of the Plant Free MD, and here with a very uh, special pair of guests, Natalie uh, Kovrick and Tara Vander Dusen. I hope I pronounced that right, I probably didn't. They are the co-hosts of the Discover Ag podcast together. Uh, Natalie and Tara, thank you so much for coming on. How are you both? Hi, thanks for having us on. Yeah, we're doing good. We're excited to be here. Good. So uh, for those who haven't come across uh, your work or your social media and podcast, can you uh, tell us who you are and what you guys do? Yeah, I'll kick us off. So my name's Tara Vanderdeesen. So you were really close on the pronunciation. <laughs> Both Natalie and I have tough names. Um, so I actually am a dairy farmer in New Mexico. I grew up on a dairy farm. I'm a fifth generation dairy farmer. And then I married a fifth generation dairy farmer. So we now dairy farm with his family and our two daughters in New Mexico. Uh, my husband manages day-to-day operations on our dairy farm. And then my role is actually, I got my degree in environmental science. So I deal with, I always joke, it's kind of the, the back end of the dairy. It's, you know, the manure mm-hmm. management, soil health, water conservation, um, just assisting my clients with permits and regulations. And then about seven years ago, I was, you know, classic millennial on social media. And I was just seeing a ton of misinformation about dairy and sustainability and like its role in impacting the environment. And so I kind of just started sharing online you know, facts and information that I thought people might be interested in. And that has obviously grown and changed and evolved over the years uh, to the point where we're at now. I partnered with uh, Natalie about a year and a half ago and launched, you know, Discover Ag podcast and some, some other businesses as well, where we're able to share more about agriculture and what we're seeing and, you know, kind of be able to have these conversations around food, where our food comes from, our food systems and in ag in general. Right. And Natalie, tell us a bit about yourself. So like Tara, I grew up in agriculture. Um, I grew up on a ranch though. So beef cattle, um, actually in Southwest Montana, I was brought to Nebraska, which is where I am now when I married my husband. Um, like Tara, I started sharing online, um, you know, five, six years ago for a dairy, very different reason though. I actually started direct to consumer beef business with my, um, a different co-partner. I did that for a couple of years and that's really when I saw, I think the power of social media and just, you know, connecting with people and talking about agriculture. And I think also recognizing that we are a little bit, you know, we're 2% of the population. And I kind of forgot that when I'm ex- all I'm exposed to, you know, growing up in ag and being in ag and marrying into agriculture. And so I think I saw that, you know, that recognition that there's people who are interested in seeing what we're doing. And so I kind of pivoted from that direct to consumer beef business and started sharing more personal stuff, which like Tara said, brought us together. And, um, a year ago, you know, we created discover ag. Oh, very cool. And so is that how you guys met it just uh, over, over your work on social media? Yeah. So we met on the internet. I feel like people always find that so funny, especially maybe our parents and older generations that we met online when we started sharing, you know, seven years ago was not that long ago, but it was a while ago in the world of social media. There was not a ton of people in ag sharing online, not a lot of women sharing in ag online. And so we kind of had a group where we were supporting each other, talking with each other. And that's how we met and just ended up meeting in real life and our friendship and our business grew from there. Right. And so what were some of these, you know, mis- you know some of this misinformation that, that you saw that, that sparked your desire to, to sort of correct the, the narrative? Yeah. When it comes to the cattle side or the beef side of it, I guess, I think one of the big things we're up against right now is really, you know, the beef is bad for the environment, you know, that cows are ruining the planet. Um, and so I spend a lot of time or I did, you know, as Tara mentioned earlier, I think what you share about online kind of like ebbs and flows. And the last couple of years, I've taken a pretty strong stance and kind of like talking about, you know, cows role in climate and what that actually looks like and means. Yeah. And I mean, for me, I was coming at it from the dairy side, but obviously we both have the commonality of having cattle. Um, and so both of us kind of share in that realm, like what does cattle mean for the environment for Natalie? You know, it's grazing cattle out on pasture in a beef, you know, in a cattle ranch. Um, for me, it's like, what can dairy cattle be doing? Uh, you know, dairy cattle on the flip side of the coin, um, end up eating a lot of our byproducts and things that would otherwise end up in landfill and also play an important role in impacting the environment in a positive way 
but in a completely different way than beef cattle do. And so it's kind of cool to be able to come together and share those different perspectives from both the dairy and the beef world. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. But for those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore Market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. And that's obviously something that, that people talk about now. You know, I've, I've been pushing that that this is a very important thing for us to include in our diets, if not exclusively uh, have in our diets. But a lot of the questions that I get are or or people that say fire back, like, okay, well, maybe that, that's good for us, but it's not sustainable. It's going to destroy the planet. And, you know, we, we can't do that. So how would you, how would you both answer that? Well, how long do your listeners want to sit, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sit around and listen to us talk? Um, first off, I do think it's really interesting. We got to this place in society. Like, I feel like you look back and you just wonder how did we get to this place where we've had ruminants grazing forever. If you look back in history and all of a sudden now they're the culprit. And so you know, just grasping, like, how did we get to this point in society? I feel like always kind of blows my mind, you know, but to, I guess, start getting into the weeds of the conversation. I always, again, as Tara mentioned, you know, we're a cow calf operation, which means we have a lot of mamas and a lot of babies running around out at pasture. We're in a very beautiful part of Nebraska. I think a lot of people associate the Midwest with, you know, the corn belt, which is fine. We're obviously that's some, you know, something we mainly produce, but my, our ranch is in an area known as the Nebraska Sandhills, and it's a very large, you know, grassland ecosystem. It's intact. It's beautiful. It's, it's one of the largest ones I think in, um, the nation, if not the world. And so, you know, cattle play a very important role in that. And I love highlighting that relationship between, you know, what cows are doing when they're grazing the benefits, um, when it comes to the soil, when it comes to the water, when it comes to biodiversity, when it comes to, you know, plant life and animal life. And so I think getting into that actual role of how you manage cattle plays a really big part of the environment. And it has, when you go all the way back to like the Buffalo roaming, you know, before we industrialized, before we colonized. And so I think trying to make that connection of they're actually a very integral part of maintaining these grasslands of playing a role for the soil. Yeah. And I think, I'm oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say, I feel like with this conversation and we can get more into this, but you know, we have, we've had very carbon tunnel vision focusing on like the amount of carbon and not looking at like the entire picture as Natalie talked about, like, you know, really looking at the ecosystems of these grasslands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, 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 it wouldn't be true. I mean, these, these grasslands co-evolved with the large ruminant animals as well. You know, they, they, they played off each other. And, um, you know, I believe that that's, that's been attributed to the fertility of these major grasslands and plains like the middle of America and elsewhere around the world. That was actually one of the things that I heard about Australia is why it wasn't as fertile as other, you know, uh, continents because they, they didn't have large ruminant animals that helped bring about these big grasslands and then, you know, really, really fix a lot of nutrients in the soil. Um, so how would, I guess that would be some of the arguments as well. You know, some, you know, even, even, um, people like Alan, I don't know if you're familiar with Alan Savory, if you come across him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very interesting guy, but yeah, and he, and he's been taking large herds of animals and putting them through deserts and reversing deserts, but you listen to him talk and he still attributes the, the cause of the major deserts around the world from, you know, herd animals, like herding animals. Um, I disagree with that. I think that's it's actually from, from crop agriculture, and that's what turned the middle of America into the Dust Bowl in the in the early 1900s. And uh, we had to sort of reverse that, reverse gears, and uh, to save the middle of America from turning into a desert. But that is the argument. That's the conventional argument that that overgrazing will cause problems. And I think that probably does. So what what's what's um, you know is there is there a way that you can properly raise cattle that you're benefiting the land versus versus hurting it or and can you destroy the land by overgrazing and things like that yeah absolutely i think you know being in the medical world you know you probably relate to the like the um 
poison is in the dose, right? So too much of any, you know, too much of a good thing can be bad and too much of a bad thing. You know, it's just, it's all in how, um, I guess, uh, the scale of it or the spectrum of it. And so the same thing comes with animals. I mean, you could have someone that, um, you know, is not, maybe they are at grasslands, right? So it's not a feedlot when we think of, you know, when we think of beef as bad, we think of conventional, right? But so let's put us on in a, a grasslands situation. You could still be doing everything right. And if you're not properly managing them, they could overgraze. But if you are properly managing them, then they're part of the cycle. And so it really comes down to, you know, land management. It really comes down to land stewardship. Like as ranchers, we have a very important role and it's not just animal husbandry. It's also managing the land and the soil and both of them together. And so, you know, we have, um, my husband and I, we do cover crops, we do, um, rotational grazing. Um, you know, we do a lot of things to take care of our land because that's, you know, at the end of the day, we have a couple bottom lines. One of them is the animals and one of them is the land. You mentioned the Dust Bowl. And it's funny that you said that because just yesterday we were recording for our podcast, uh, Discover Ag, and we were talking about some of the root causes of the Dust Bowl. And it was um, the article we were covering was about bison and the removal of bison and how mm-hmm. that played a role in the Dust Bowl that we were removing grazing animals. Like the these grasslands, as you said, evolved with ruminant animals grazing on them. And so I think that we can mimic those with cattle. As Natalie said, it's about land management. It's about, you know, the ranchers and the farmers working with the land and their cattle to be improving these ecosystems. Uh, and so it's just an interesting conversation when you really do look at that, like history and how it evolved and how we can continue those practices now. You yeah. could also take the same type of grassland and remove the animals from it. And as we've been kind of saying, you know, I think that's what people think you remove the animals and it will just like thrive and it will just, you know, it will just take care of itself, but it won't. I mean, you'll have desertification. You'd have wildfire problems. I mean, there's a lot of things that animals are doing. Like we talked about this on the podcast about how, if you actually get down to nature and how it's designed, I mean, it's designed to function uh, within itself. Um, but animals are a part of that. So if you remove them, you're going to have problems within nature. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing people forget is that animals are part of nature, you know, and and it's not, we're not like born invasive species that come from space and are just just (laughs) this natural ecosystem. Like you animals are the ecosystem It's part of the ecosystem. And you, you take one out and you're going to mess that up. So, you know, the law of unintended consequences, you mess with a complex system, you're going to get very bad uh, outcomes that you you can't necessarily predict. So, and I, yeah. I was just going to say, I think that's one of the things when it comes to us as, you know, consumers, shoppers, buyers, I think sometimes we ask for things and we don't fully understand, you know, maybe what we're asking for or the unintended consequences of what we're asking for. And I think that's actually a big problem when it comes to the food system is a lot of people have opinions about what we should be doing for the food system and how it should be, you know, raised and grown and produced without fully understanding like, okay, maybe yes, that would be a good change to make to our food system, but that would actually also bring X, Y, Z as a result. Are you prepared for that? Is that something you have thought about? And I don't think we always make that connection of like, you know, maybe long-term or, you know, the ripple effect. We're just kind of like, it's very tunnel focus of, okay, our food needs to be this way. You know, our land needs to be this way. And it's, it's just not a broad scope picture. And, and I think agriculture and food absolutely has to be a big picture. Yeah, it was, um, it was something I was reading by, by Thomas Saul. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's an economist and, and an author and super interesting guy. And when he was doing his um, degrees, um, he, he did his undergraduate at, at Harvard and then uh, went on from there and did his PhD at, at Chicago. But when he was at Harvard, he um, he said he had a professor there that said, "Okay, so if you if you do this, you know, do you want to do this or this or whatever?" And he said, well, "Okay, well, I would I would do you know choice A." I said, "Okay," and then what would happen after that? I said, "Okay, well, this would probably happen, and then what? And then what? And then what?" And it got around to the point that he just said, "Oh shoot, okay, that actually had that probably would lead to a, a consequence that I didn't want." And so that's that's the trick. And so he wrote a book called. Um, applied economics, thinking past step one. And so, you know, you have to sort of think, okay, and then you got to think sort of like a chess, a chess master, you know, where you're thinking, you know, dozen steps down, two dozen steps down the chain to see, okay, what is going to happen as opposed to just, well, well, this feels bad. I don't want to do that. It's icky. Well, cows, that's even grass. Well, grass is good. Grass is nature. You know, that that's bad for that. And people are very, you know, they get caught up in very surface level uh, ideas. And, and I think that people prey on that. 
uh, for different uh, for different reasons. And I think that's part of why we're having the conversations that we're having right now is because someone makes that service level argument and they say, no, 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 there is no stage two, it's only stage one. And of course, there, it's such a complex system that um, you have to think in these, these sort of stepwise progression sort of ways. Yeah, that's something Natalie and I talk a lot about is that agriculture is very nuanced. It is a lot of information. There's a ton of detail that goes into it. It is not black and white. There's not like one single answer. And these headlines, you know, they do exactly what they're supposed to do. It's just like a quick little blurb that people then like take as like law and that that's it. That's the end all be all. And they don't go any deeper than that. And we were listening to a Mike Rowe podcast and he had a quote that I love that was like the headline is like the killer of conversation. And it was that and I agreed with it so much like people read the headline and then that's it there's no discussion after that there's no more nuance to the conversation and with ag like everything is so much deeper than that there's so much of the things that we don't even fully understand with all the science we have how can we expect to just know like oh removing cattle that's it like <laughs> that's going to be the answer when there's just so many more layers deeper than that and i mean we haven't even gotten into like the nutrition side of things of how you know what this plays into our nutrition um just on the environment side yeah there was um it's funny i saw a a study from uh, columbia university and they found that 52% of people that you see some sort of catchy clickbait sort of headline or something like that, that 52% of people won't even click on the article, will not read the article, but will comment and argue like they've read it just based on, on the headline. And so it's just like, they'll read the headline and that's the only thing uh, that they care about. And they found that, that people not only were arguing and talking about these things, but had, had never clicked the article. And, and that's, and that's what you see now. Now people only want to have conversation. We talked about in, in years for the last few decades, talking about how our attention span is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And now it's gone to the point of just a soundbite. Like that's, that's the only, that's like as far as people can actually, you know, grasp is just like, oh, this soundbite, like, oh, if it's longer than that, I don't want to hear about it. And, uh, and I always say that to people, you know, when I was having a discussion with someone online and they were, they were, you know, vegan and they were like, okay, well, what about this? And what about this? And they were actually being, you know, engaging in a conversation. And so I was, I was just replying um, politely. And, um, and I was just like, listen, I actually did a video covering all of these arguments and all these things. And, you know, you can take a look at it. And like, if you have questions after that, like you'll come to me, but like everything that you're asking me, I've addressed here. And so he's like, okay, I'll take a look at it. I sent him the link and he just came right back. He's like, oh, 44 minutes. Nope. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, you know, like these things, these discussions can't be done in headlines, you know, like it's like there's there's actual substance to these things. You have to have to actually dig into them and, uh, and you can't just you can't just talk in sound bites. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not even surprised. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, for us, agriculture and farmers and ranchers, it's like our our headlines, our sound bites, they're not sexy, right? Like the carbon mm -hmm. cycle of a cow, you can't make that sexy in five words. And you, you know, it's hard to talk about carbon versus methane and the differences and make that sound cool too. And so we, I feel like we're at a disadvantage that we have very complex, not super interesting things, but very important things, right? Like mm -hmm. things we should be investing those 44 minutes into, but we'd rather, you know, watch a nine second clip of something else. And so, yeah, it, it's hard to go up against that. Yeah, or 44 minutes worth of like, you know, cat memes or something like that, you know. Just, <laughs> oh, definitely yeah, they're watching like, 44 minute of nine second clips, but like cool. sitting down and watching 44 minutes of actual like thought provoking conversation is is too much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And or, or just you know, quibbling over text for 44 minutes, because I mean, we've easily been like going back and forth for like an hour. I'm like, look, this is this will be this will save all of us a lot of time. Just watch this. You know, but yeah, it's it's very funny and um, and uh, disturbing at the same time. You know, but um, uh, so speaking about that, I actually had had a question. I saw um, a couple of people that they were doing sort of regenerative ag agriculture. You know, in the sense like like you were talking about, you know, rotating animals through different pastures and um, you know having you know different animals following different pastures, and then you know the chickens following a few days after that, and they were like eating the bugs off the you know the the feces and things like that. So it was just this this stepwise progression and that that just made sort of upcycling nutrients and all these sorts of things. And they found that, that 
that was you know putting more nutrients down in in the ground that the grass was growing much more readily so they could they could they could support more animals the ground was getting more and more fertile as opposed to less and more plants were coming and more grass was growing and they also found that the um that the meat and the eggs were actually having a much higher level of like nutrients and vitamins and minerals and things like that is that is that typical in regenerative farming? Is that something that you guys find with with your style of farming? Does that actually increase the nutritional uh, value of of the products that you're producing? So our beef actually enters like the conventional supply chain. So <clears throat> excuse me. So we would uh, we calve in like May, kind of just this is just our operation too. That's one of the hard things about agriculture is you could listen to me as a rancher. And then you could bring on another rancher and they may have a completely different life cycle. So for anyone who is listening, um, it's just not a copy stamp repeat. There's a lot of variables that go into agriculture from farming and ranching perspective. So I'll just talk a little bit about our operation. Um, so our cattle are bored. We calve in May. Um, we, they would stay with the mamas. Uh, we would graze them out at pasture all summer long. We do that all the way until fall. We're actually in a, again, being in, where we're located in Nebraska, we're actually able to graze corn stalks, which is a pretty cool thing. We can use that as feedstock for animals. So we'll go from pasture land, um, out to corn stalks and we graze that through the winter. And then we have a small period of time between when the farmers need us back off of the corn stalks before we can put them back on grass that we'll have to actually like supplement ourselves, like with hay or things like that. Um, and so that is a normal cycle for us and we're conventional operation. So, um, I, I can't speak to, you know, a small level of regenerative agriculture, but I think what we can pull from that is there's a spectrum of regenerative, right? So you would look at our operation we're we're, we're pretty large in the scale of things. So when it comes to the United States, I know you have like probably a worldwide base of listeners, but when it comes to the U.S., the average herd size for a beef farm is actually only 43 cows. Um, our operation is, yeah, it's very tiny, which is, is something I think that's really overlooked. Um, and we can even get into the rabbit hole because I love to talk about how the beef industry is vastly different than the chicken and pig industry, which is not something that people, they kind of lump animal proteins all together and it's just not accurate. Um, so anyway, we're much larger than that, but we still do a lot of the same things that maybe you would have, you know, a small regenerative farmer that's talking about, you know, this multi-species grazing where he has the chicken going through and he has the, you know, maybe he's grazing like sheep with the, the cattle as well. Um, it's just a spectrum, right? So we're doing some of the same principles. We're just doing it, you know, in a different way. Um, and it goes back to our conversation really of like our jobs as ranchers is to look at the land we're at. Someone who is practicing, you know, quote unquote, regenerative agriculture in Georgia is going to look a lot different than someone who's practicing quote unquote, regenerative agriculture in Nebraska. You know, we have a different stocking rate. We have different rainfall. We have different soil. Even the soil from our operation from pasture to pasture can be different, right? So when we're out at the sand hills, I talk about that soil so much more different than we would have cattle grazing, maybe closer to our home base. And so we're going to have to rotate those differently. We're going to have to manage them differently. And so there's just a lot of variables that can go into it. So I think when it comes to regenerative agriculture, I, I would love for people to understand that there's a spectrum there is, it's not black or white. Again, going back, it's not, you don't check a box and say like, yes, I'm regenerative check. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, I am instilling these principles and then there's a spectrum of how we can instill them where we're located. Okay. I don't know. That was a really long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Yeah, no, that's great. So, and so I'll answer on the dairy side, I guess, on the flip side okay. of that coin. We're also conventional. And um, I joke, like I, we have the world's largest cheese plant near us. So all of our milk goes to cheese and people are always like, oh, what cheese can we buy? Like, where can we buy your cheese? And I'm like, it's probably like the Walmart brand. Like I know we yeah. send to Subway <laughs> and, you know, people like to not always think of like the, you know, the store bought brands as like less than, but I would put our milk quality up because against anyone's like we have a phenomenal milk quality in our milk shed, like our milk area. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's just the way the system is it, you know, big does not mean bad. Small does not mean good. Like there is, it's a spectrum. I love that Natalie used that word. It's a spectrum in all sorts of practices and, um, how you're implementing different practices on your farm. Right. And so what do you think is is behind this sort of anti-meat narrative? This is, is growing bigger and bigger. There's a lot of weird things happening. And, and a lot of people are saying, obviously, we've been saying for years, or people have been saying for years that meat is bad for you, causes 
heart disease and things like that. But they really started ramming it down this year. Actually, somebody just sent me a um, a picture of like their niece or something like that, that that had a project at school up in Canada where they said, you know, um, you know is carnivore diet a fad diet? And say, what if you saw this sign and said, oh, the carnivore diet, it could help you and, you know, and help you lose weight and, and get better and things like this. Would you call this a fad diet? And why would you call this? A, it, was, it was very leading and, uh, and manipulative of, um, of the schools to do that. But what, what do you think is going on behind this? And, and um, yeah, maybe just, just talk a bit about the, that sort of that anti-meat narrative. Yeah, I think a lot of things, unfortunately. And I always... Um... I was going to bring this up earlier when you're talking, but I think one of the, so social media is great. And the way our society is built right now is great, right? For connection. Look at us. We're connecting. We're talking about, you know, common interests and sharing. I feel like a good message. We never would have been able to do that without social media. Right. But I do feel like one of the pitfalls and downfalls of it is you can get into, um, almost an, you can feed yourself what you want to see. Right. So if you follow only vegan accounts that preach, you know, that vegan is the way and cows are killing the environment, that is what you're going to feed, you know, your mind with, and you can find a narrative basically to support whatever it is you want to support. And I feel like that's a very dangerous thing to do. So I think that's part of maybe what's happening is that we are as a society now able to feed our own addiction, essentially, you know, or feed our own belief thought. And if we don't care enough, if you're not a type of person that, you know, values, gathering information or looking at different viewpoints or, you know, what we've been talking about, taking the conversation a level deep and going beyond the headlines and the taglines, then it's going to be really easy to fall into some of these things that are absolutely not true. Um, you mentioned the school system, which is funny because I, this is something I grapple with. I'm like, am I just in my own little bubble where I feel like people are out to get me as a rancher? And it's, it's just a loud voice. That's not, you know, like the majority, it's just one loud, crazy person over here yelling at me. is talking about how, you know, cows are killing the environment. Last week on the podcast, we talked about how there is a school system in Utah that was talking, having their students do reports on crickets as a protein source because cows are killing the environment. And so I feel like you do see these things where you're like, no, I'm not making this up. Like there are things to be concerned about where we're seeing these headlines and we're seeing people preach. And so I think it's getting into the school system. I think celebrities are playing a role. I think influencers online are playing a role. I mean, there's a lot of people who quote unquote are sharing their, you know, expertise opinion. Um, and it's going a lot farther than it used to before we had, you know, social media. I think as far as you talked about with the, you know, fad diet of like being a carnivore, I think it's crazy that we've gotten to this point, considering like, if you look at our evolution of eating meat, uh, the fact that there are like, in my mind, it just, I'm like, how can it make sense that people want to completely remove a source of food that is so nutrient dense? Like there, I don't think there is like a planet that, or a place where you can truly put a plant against a piece of steak and like convince someone that like, there's not more nutrients in the steak. Like there absolutely is more nutrients in that steak than any other food source on the planet. And it's like, how have we gotten so gotten this like so wrong? How have we gotten so removed from the very basis of the fact there is more protein in a steak than just about any other food on the planet, especially compared to, you know, calories and all these other things. And it's, it is wild that we are like in a place where we have school systems teaching and implementing these practices, having students talk about, you know, do these essays. Uh, it just seems really like backwards. Like sometimes I have to stop and think like, how on earth did we get here? Yeah. And it's pretty, it's pretty creepy as well, you know, because like schools aren't supposed to be doing, I mean, that, that's the parents' job to feed their kids and to talk about food. And, um, you know, you're supposed to be teaching, or you used to be reading, writing, and arithmetic or, you know, classic, um, you know, education, you know, learning the classics, learning languages, learning things that would serve you as, as an adult, as opposed to, you know, being taught how to think as opposed to what to think. And now it's mm -hmm. kind of being taught what to think. And I also think it's funny having a fad diet, called, you know, um, being attributed to what we've always eaten and, and what all the best evidence shows mm -hmm. we've been eating for millions of years now. And so, and certainly up until very recently, everyone sort of understood that this was, this was the best source of nutrition. I mean, very simply, we are animal tissue. And the point of eating is to build and maintain our animal tissue. 
right? So what's going to be, what's going to have most of those nutrients is, is other animal tissue. It's, it's, you, you don't have to do like a big conversion. It's there, it's pre-made, it's already there. It's already done for you. Plant tissue is very foreign. It's, it's, very, it's as alien as it can get here on earth. And it's an entire different kingdom of life. And that's not very easy to then turn that animal tissue into, or sorry, turn that plant tissue into animal tissue. There are some animals that can do it, but we're not great at it. And so we, we do benefit from just going straight to the source. And, and just the argument that that animal tissue, which we are, is somehow inherently bad for us. And I always wonder, it's like, okay, so your, your muscle in your arm, that's going to cause cancer to you? That's going to that's gonna give you heart disease just being in your body? Does that, does that make any sort of sense? And um, no one ever really has an answer for that, <laughs> you know? But, uh, and they don't, like, when, you, when you sort of ask them, like, like, you know, why would animal tissue, why would just the body of an animal all of a sudden be carcinogenic and, and cause all this damage? And what, you know, what sense does that make? But it's, it really baffles me that we were sort of even having this discussion. I mean, I do think we've lost touch with a little bit of like fact and reality as a society. We just interviewed um, a research scientist out of Colorado State, and she said something that I will never forget. She said, when it comes to, you know, the food or agriculture, you know, whatever you want to call this, she said, it is the only industry that science and emotion are on the same level. And I thought, wow, if that's not true. And so I think the emotion factor plays a really large role into this. You know, you talk about, again, going back to the science of like what our bodies are built of and like what we need to sustain our bodies. Um, people don't want to hear, you know, there's the top of a food chain. People don't want to hear that we're primates, that we have carnivoral instincts. They don't want to hear, you know, they don't want to think about the killing of the animals that, you know, this emotion has come into play. And especially when it comes to these vegan vegetarian lifestyles that, you know, they really build a lot of their decision-making off of that emotional factor. I have listened to so many interesting, and I have friends that have, you know, shared personally about, you know, their thoughts and beliefs as a vegetarian and a vegan. Um, and it's pretty astounding, you know, it's hard to combat science and some of this reality when they're so deeply rooted in an emotional standpoint, almost. Uh, I have so many things I want to say to both of your guys' statements, but I'm going to start with, um, you know, you mentioned that at, like in your last comment about how there are some animals that can turn plant material into, you know, protein. And it, we had another scientist on Dr. Von Holder, and he was talking about how cattle are literally one of the only, they are the only animal on the planet, they can take plant food and turn it into better quality protein. And it's because of, you know, enzymes in their stomach, their multiple compartments of their stomach, and they turn 60 grams of protein into a hundred grams of complete protein. So 60 grams yeah. of incomplete plant protein into a hundred grams of complete protein. That's incredible. And mm. we get to benefit from that. We don't have that in our stomach. There's not a, that's never going to happen for us it is, we have to consume those animals. And when you really like think it goes back to kind of the very beginning of our conversation, like the, like underlying principles that are at play, the science that's at play here that we don't fully understand, uh, that is going into making this protein is really incredible. And then to Natalie's point about, you know, the vegans, I've seen a lot of vegan comments that have talked about like, oh, well, if you actually had to like butcher your own animals, like you wouldn't be able to do it. And I'm like, the opposite is true. Back when most people butchered their own animals, most people had no problem eating meat. It's because we have gotten so disconnected from our food sources and that we don't understand that life cycle is why we've ended up, I think, where we've ended up. Yeah, I, I, I always thought that was very funny. As I mean, someone who hasn't just paid attention to any part of human history. Uh, I mean, just, I mean, just read. You know, it's all about, you know, like, you know, you know, killing uh, lambs and, and rams and things like that for feasts. And it's all about, you know, just just eating animals and things like that. And they talk about it. it's like, yes, they did this and this is how they did it, you know. And um, I mean, just that is just a, a, a solid fact that everyone was was part of the food chain of, of the, you know, the food cycle and things like that. But you're right. We've been we've been you know divorced from our our own food and, and, and where our food comes from that it's, it's very easy for people to forget where it comes from and, and, and to also forget that farming crops is no different. You, know, you have to destroy an entire ecosystem just to grow a single crop. You kill all the plants, all the animals. 50% of, 55% of Borneo's rainforests are gone now. 
they've, they've turned those into palm crops, killed all the orangutans, killed all the snakes, killed all the animals living there. And then I heard someone say, they're like, oh, well, you know, yeah, that's true. But then they they just planted trees again. So, you know, same, same, you know, it's just it's like, no. <laughs> like same not same, 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 not same, same. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's yeah. this. There's this dietitian I follow the couple. I, there's two things I want to touch on that you said, there's this dietitian I follow. And she said, you know, not to continue this emotion thing, but I just think it plays such a large role. She says that the further you are from your food source, the more you fear your food source. And I think, mm. you know, you talk a lot about how we forget where it comes from. I don't know if that's so much it anymore as that, that fear factor enters in a lot of questions enter in. Like when we're removed, we have questions about, okay, what are they doing? What did they do? What does this mean? Like, let's go down the the label rabbit hole of like the problem of food labeling in our system right now. You know, I feel like as a consumer, when you're removed from your sis food system, you see these labels and you start questioning like, oh, what's that word mean? Oh, is that word better than that one? You know, I, that emotion creeps in when we remove ourselves from the food system. And I think that's a, you know, again, a big, big problem we have. And then, yeah, going to, you know, I like to call it almost hypocrisy when the the lifestyle that's advocating for, you know, plant only or more plant. Um, it's like, if we cared about, you know, carbon, no one is talking about agriculture is the only industry or forestry. If you count that with it, that is a carbon sink, right? So we can actually remove carbon from the environment and, you know, no one wants to talk about that. So you want to play, you know, remove the animals from this, this industry that could actually be a solution to some of our problems. Um, and go to plant-based or, you know, all planting all crops. It's like, there goes our soil. You know, we have a lot of things to consider if you were to, to do that. And not only that you have marginal land versus non-marginal land. So a lot of cattle graze, what can only be used to graze cattle, right? Again, my ranch is a beautiful example of that. If you follow along on my personal Instagram, you'll see us out at pasture on horseback riding through beautiful fields that are very steep, very, you know, uh, just not, you could not get a tractor out there to plant. And here in Nebraska, we're not growing grapes and avocados and other things, you know, like where we're at is beautifully built to graze cattle. And so if you want to just kick that out, it's like, we're already a nutrient starved nation and we're already, you know, a food secure nation too. And you want to kick out an animal that not only upcycles and turns inedible, you know, cellulose into protein, you want to kick that out, but you also want to kick out the nutrition portion of it. Like that's incredibly irresponsible. And on the other side of that, you want to remove cattle, then you're going to be removing a very great nutrient source for our soils. Nobody is talking about that in the plant world, in the plant-based world, that manure is the best fertilizer. Like I'll, I, we are not out on pasture. Our animals are confined, but one of the great things about that is we collect all of our manure and compost it all. And then it leaves our farm and goes out to other farms as fertilizer. If we didn't have that cow manure, we wouldn't be producing, you know, nutrition for our soils. Like we, that's a whole nother piece of this, that like, we need those animals and we need their manure in order to provide for our soils to continue this entire cycle. Yeah. What's the thing, um, guy, I was talking to you, Dr. Peter uh, Ballerstedt, who's, oh, um, yeah. have, you, have you guys talked, spoken to him? Yeah, we ran into him at a conference a couple of months ago. Oh, great. Natalie nice. totally fangirled over him when she met him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. What, which, um, which conference was that? Uh, we were in Denver at the Global uh, Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually saw him in Denver at uh, Low Carb Denver. He was there as well. That was just- Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple things in Denver and mm -hmm. um, I guess you just didn't have to go too far. So that's good. And, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he pointed out that you can't have plant agriculture without animal agriculture. It, mm -hmm. it, and, um, you know, everyone thinks it's like, well, um, you know, you have to, you know, you have to grow all these crops for, you know, for the cows and things like that. And, um, you know, he was pointing out that it's like, well, no, actually 92% of the, the feed that animals eat are inedible by humans. Like you say, they're, they're upcycling. It's a bunch of cellulose, a bunch of sticks and twigs and things like that that we're not going to be able to do anything with, but the cows can, and they can turn that into very high nutrient um, steaks. And, um, and then also their, their byproducts are what is, is re rejuvenating the soil. And, that, and that's, you know, I mean, people are gonna say, it's like, oh, these are, these, this is just big, Big beef or big cattle or big <laughs> big egg, yeah, big egg. Um, but you know the, the alternative to this is is um, you know big oil because the the only the only other 
you know, really um, fertilizer source that I'm I'm aware of is is like petroleum based. So they, you know, that that could be part of this as well. They're trying to edge out, you know, um, animal agriculture so that they can sell more of their very substandard um, fertilizers and things like that. And that actually is, uh, you know, a big industry that is that is, you know, trying to to inf influence and infiltrate different markets like this. Yeah, I a couple love. Go ahead, Natalie. As I say, a couple of things on that. Um, again, being a medicine, so I always forget to mention this, but I am a pharmacist by education, and so I actually practiced uh, full time pharmacy and then part time pharmacy, and now I just kind of fill in. But um, you know, it's really cool when it, you look at like the byproducts of an animal, what it actually goes into, and so um, you know, people talk about again, like let's end animal agriculture or remove these. It's like, okay, say bye to a lot of your medicine. Okay. Say bye to a lot of fillers in, you know, everyday things that we're using, say goodbye to, you know, I don't know, tennis. I mean, it's, it's insane what you actually look at, what an animal contributes to. Um, and then the other thing, there's actually studies, like if people want to get into the, again, going back to like carbon and footprint, um, you know, we talked about, you mentioned that the 86% percent of what, uh, cattle consume is not edible by humans. Um, there are studies that show if we didn't, the cattle weren't consuming those byproducts, we'd actually maybe see our um, carbon footprint go up because th those products have to go to a landfill, right? So there's a study that shows if, if you compost it, which is like the best case scenario and like, are we really, let's be realistic. Are we all really going to compost all that? You know, not in today's society. Um, the footprint went up by five times. If you put it into a landfill, it went up by 49 times. And so I think, again, we're just forgetting the, these the things that the role cattle play and what would actually happen, the unintended consequences, if we tried to kick them out of the cycle, because they're, they're just the more and more you get into the weeds, the more and more you realize how pertinent and important they are. Well, Natalie just teed me up perfect for what I wanted to say, because <laughs> my favorite thing to do when we have tours on our dairy is we go to the commodity barn, which is basically like our cow's pantry. Like it's a massive area with all the different ingredients that go into our cow's diet. And it's amazing when my husband starts listing off all of the byproducts that our cattle are consuming, like entire just feed bunks that are filled with tons and tons and tons of byproducts, byproducts from ethanol, you know, byproducts from, um, you can feed, I know lots of dairies that feed like bakery waste, like things that leave bakery that can't be consumed grocery store waste. Um, you know, if you're in California, a lot of times, or even Florida, I know a lot of the dairy cattle get fed like citrus waste from making orange juices, um, different tons of different fruits and vegetables that are processed and you have leftovers and the cattle are able to eat them. And the alternative is like Natalie said, if it goes to a landfill, it is a significant larger contributor. I'm sorry. There's a train going by my house right now. <laughs> um, but there is a significant larger contribution to our carbon footprint. And instead cattle are able to upcycle that for us, reduce that impact and actually turn it into nutrient dense food. And on our dairy, obviously milk, and then ultimately beef. And it's, really cool to see that. And it's something I don't think anyone ever thinks about when you eat, you know, your, or you have pour your glass of orange juice. You don't think about what happens to the pulp or when you get your non pulp orange juice, what happens to the rind, all of that can get fed to cattle. Yeah. Tara and I were actually down, uh, last fall, we were visiting a cotton farm in California and that's a huge uh, byproduct that is used from the cotton industry to feed cattle um, and almonds, almond holes. Like, uh, so again, it's this kind of secular thing where it's pretty cool that agriculture can take the waste from other parts of agriculture. And instead of dumping it into a landfill, um, we can again, feed it to a cow and it can make this piece of protein, which again is one of the most complete but be beneficial nutrient dense things we can put it as our, in our body as a human. One thing yeah. I always have to ask people on tours on dairy is if they're allergic to peanuts, because, um, we have a lot of peanut production in our area and our calves are bedded with peanut shells. So the shells are really soft when they're crunched up, they make really great bedding. And so you can walk into our calf barn and literally see like lots of little peanut holes. Um, and that's what we bed with that would otherwise, again, like we actually can pay the farmer for it. So they generate a revenue from a waste stream on their farm. And it's a really great betting for us. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, yeah, almond, almond husk, I think it's just like wood. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, actually <laughs> that do something with that. Yeah. That's, that's actually pretty amazing. That. Yeah. Cows are cool, man. I mean that we need to be, that's our sound bite that we need to try and get out there. Yeah. <laughs> Cows are cool. There's our sexy sound bite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the thing. And yeah. And that, that's always the, the, 
the arguments, you know, go from nutrition while, you know, you know, arguing that, you know, this is, this is better, better for our nutrition. You can sort of get there. And then they, then people will switch over to, oh, well, the environmental impact. And then, you know, you talk about that and then, and then they'll always switch over to the ethical side of things as well. And those are sort of the three main arguments mm -hmm. why we should eat one way or the other. And I remember, it was, I can't, I can't exactly who, remember who exactly it was, but it was a famous sort of vegetarian and intellectual hundred years ago or so. And he said that um, vegetarians are, are just people who've never heard a tomato scream, you know, and um, you know, it's sort of a funny thing, but uh, you know, when I, I understand where he came from, you know, you see animal suffering, he doesn't like that. And so that's fair enough, but you know, there was, there was a time that people didn't think that animals could feel pain the way we would. And that's why it was, it was okay to treat them certain ways. Obviously we know better now and we have laws protecting them, which is important. And people don't understand that either. They think they're just abused and, and, and tortured and, and humiliated. And, and, um, and that's not the case. You I mean, you go to jail, if you do something like that and you should. And, um, but now we know that better that animals, you know, obviously, well, why, I mean, why would they feel pain differently than we do? But but now we know that about plants too. Plants actually do feel pain. They have a they have a, a sort of a nervous system, and they feel and respond to damage, which is what pain is. And they they actually scream. They send out chemical signals to other plants, saying, "Hey, I'm being attacked. I'm being killed. Protect yourself." They can send out specific signals if they're getting eaten by a certain animal or insect. They'll send out a specific signal. All the plants will start increasing the the toxins for that for that animal or insect. And uh, you know they don't. They actually have a very very complex interaction. Uh, with the other plants around them. And, you know, it's it's not nice that we have to eat something and that something has to die for us to live, but it is reality. And, you know, there's no nice way of doing that, but, you know, it's it, it's it's going to be one thing or the other. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, uh, we do have to do something or, or we die or our kids die or our parents die. And, I guess you, you can make that choice as an individual to let yourself just go, but something has to suffer, something has to die. And what you can do is you can, you know, make it as, as ethical and humane as possible and still feed yourself what you need and give your kids what they need. Yeah. So going back to earlier, when I said that, I feel like we are just a little bit removed from reality. I think people forget how vicious nature is. Right. Mm. So I saw a really funny meme the other day of, uh, oh, I'm glad you're going to well, share this. I think this I is totally funny, was. but I don't know. <laughs> um, there was a deer laying in a hospital bed and it had love, like, you know, humans surrounding them. And it said, you know, how vegans think wildlife pass away. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's pretty vicious out there, you know, of what could happen to animals if we aren't, you know, protecting them or caring for them. Um, and so, yeah, I have a big, a pretty big problem when people like to lump, um, you know, ranchers or farmers. I just had someone attack me on Twitter the other day about how we rape abuse, you know, all of the terrible things that ranchers are doing to their cattle. And I obviously have a very huge issue with that because I have been involved in agriculture. You know, I was raised on a cattle ranch. I married a, you know, a rancher. I now cattle, you know, raise cattle with um, him and our children. And um, it could not be further from the truth. Are there outliers that abuse animals? Absolutely. But that's going to be the same in any industry. Is there, you know, a medical professional that doesn't care for his patients properly that is, you know, corrupt? Absolutely. Like there is not, you can't point me to an industry that doesn't have corrupt people in it. It's unfortunate, you know, that there are, you know, because I guess when it comes to human, human interaction, maybe people would argue that they have the autonomy to fight back a little bit more than animals would. So yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. There are people within our industry that care for animals, you know, that don't do it the way we do, but they are absolutely 100%. And I can say this factually, um, they are the minority. They are not the rule when it comes to, you know, everyday farmers and ranchers who are caring for their animals. Yeah. I think on the dairy side, um, you know, we get attacked a lot about like the word rape gets thrown out because we use AI. And it just reminds me, I grew up on a bull bread dairy where there was no AI. It was fully bull bread. And I don't think it's this like lovely, beautiful thing that people think it is like bulls can be very aggressive. I don't know how many trucks my dad had that the door was dented in on the side because a bull like rammed his truck. Like they are very aggressive animals. And so when you see AIing in real life, you're like, oh, like, it is a very calm situation. We get to choose when the cow is bred, which means a lot of times we wait longer than what quote unquote nature would wait so that the cow isn't bred as soon. And 
until people see that though, they have this huge misconception of what it actually looks like. And, and I do agree with Natalie that nature can be aggressive. Like we were just watching a national geographic with our kids. And I remember my kids were like fighting for, you know, like they were cheering for the zebra. And I was like, don't forget that if the mom lion doesn't, you know, get the zebra, like the cubs are going to die. And they were like, oh my gosh. And it was like, this is nature. Like there is not a, a happy ending on, you know, somebody, somebody has to be fed. Someone's going to need food. And it just, is a reminder. I think we all have to, that we have to get our calories and our nutrients from somewhere, whether that's plants or animals, there's a cycle, there's a life cycle that has to take place. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I, I obviously I grew up watching nature videos and, and so I never had a, had a doubt in my mind what was going on out in the wild, but they, I think they've, they've actually changed the nature videos now. So I, I got, I got so uh, put off by uh, a nature video I saw. I think it was like you know, some sort of National Geographic thing, and there there was all this sort of narrative and and uh, editorialization that was going in as well. And it was just it was I had to turn it off. It was just a waste of time. And they had these lines that were hunting something down, and then they're sort of getting up to it, and you're like, yes, this is the exciting part. And then <laughs> us to them like eating it. I'm like no, like no, like, <laughs> you know, you, you the they left best. it out. Yeah. And so they're, oh, we don't want people to see like what is actually happening. It's like, it's, it's vicious, it's brutal. And that is life. And um, it's important to know about that. And there was one, um, there was a, a, like this, uh, I think it was like, I think maybe Disney did it, but it was, it was about lions and things like that. And they, and um, like I said, that, you know, these, these lions were hungry and they got this like bull hippo or something like that and took it down. They wouldn't show any of it. And they just, the narrator says like, oh yeah, they took this down and they killed it, but then they, you know, didn't want to eat it because it, it was just so full of rancid fat. Like that I was like, animals love fat. Like that's what exactly, <laughs> you know, oh and, it was, my it, God. and it was like, and how, how was it rancid? It was alive two minutes ago, mm. not just go rancid. It's not like living with a bunch of, you know, of, of you know, the festering fat in, you know, in its body. So it was just like, there was all this, just this weird, uh, you know, just sort of political bent on these things. And again, just, you know, trashing meat, trashing fat and, and, um, and, uh, and trying to pretend that animals don't, don't get killed or eaten in the wild. It's crazy. I, I also know there are some people that talk about like the humanization of animals through like cartoons, you know, you mentioned Disney. That's what made me think of it, like Disney mm-hmm. movies and how we humanize them and the relationships and kind of like, um, I guess, put them in a different spotlight than again, going back to like what nature is when it comes to animals. And there are people who will talk about how they kind of feel like that, that is playing a role into, especially like younger generations growing up with this mentality around like, you know, cows are friends, not food, you know, <laughs> which yeah. kind of food. I- <laughs> I try to avoid using the word, like people are always like, are your cows happy? And I actually really avoid using like human, human characteristics on animals because of that exact reason. I'm like, I, what I am worried about as the the dairy farmer is that my cows are healthy. They're comfortable that they in, are enjoying their habitat. That mm-hmm. Their pen is clean. Like all of those things are what that's my job. I cannot give a human characteristic, like happy to a cow. If it is healthy, I think that is a sign of being content with their surroundings. And to me that like the health benefit, like the health of the cow is the ultimate indicator of how we're caring for our animals. Yeah. And you know, also, you know, they've changed how, how the cartoons are as well. Cause I remember when I was a kid and certainly like the old school ones, I mean, they still had these, you know, anthropomorphized animals but they were all, they were still trying to kill and eat each other you know <laughs> yeah you know like even like like wiley coyote is trying to yeah. that bird and he's just like like you know, tom and jerry tom and yeah. jerry going after each other or you know something that just be going around they'd like look at it like they turn into a stake in their eyes and yes you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, murder and eat it and uh, at least that has <laughs> had a bit of you know sort of reality to it, it was like yeah that's that's what happens there. That's a predator that wants to kill that. It wants to eat it. And, you know, maybe, you know, has it mess up in funny ways, but it, that's, that's what it's trying to do. And, and you, you didn't, didn't, that wasn't lost on you, even though it was, a, even though it was a kid's show. Maybe that needs to be our next venture is a gruesome childhood. 
cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> Bring back the gruesome cartoons. The yeah. cartoons. Yeah, like the itchy and scratchy show or something like that. Just like just over the top <laughs> violence with uh with animals. Yeah. Yeah. I actually saw a New York Times opinion article, or it was like where you advice column. It was an advice column and it was a vegan who was sharing that their cat goes outside and they were having like a real conundrum that the cat was bringing in birds, was killing birds and bringing them back home. <laughs> and they didn't know what to do. And they were like, should I leave my, like, should I force my cat to stay inside? And I just, I had to just laugh because there was nothing else to do. But I was like, that's, that's the cat's nature. Like you are trying to change the nature of the cat. The cat, no matter how much you feed it, is going to want to go out and hunt birds and mice. And it's a predator. That's what it's mm -hmm. meant to do. And I was like, I can't believe this is our advice column in the New York Times in 2023. Yeah. And that that's, you know, when I talk to people as well, you know, on that, on the ethical side of things, they say, well, it's, it's just, you know, it's not okay to, you know, that something has to die for us. We, we shouldn't, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't kill something. I was like, okay, so so what do we do? We get rid of all predators. We get rid of all the whales, mm -hmm. all fins, all the lions, all the you know the big cats, all the you know the, the birds of prey, things like that. And and all it, um, automatically they all say it's like, oh well, no, no. I mean, that, I mean that's just that's just nature. It, yeah, we're nature too. You know, mm -hmm. like that's that we're a part of nature, and we forget that because we live in houses. But we actually are part of nature. We are animals. We're from the kingdom of Animalia. We and we grew up with these other animals and eating other animals and that that is part of it it's not nice you know but it is reality and that that and you you know deny reality at your own risk that was what uh, marcus aurelius said um in his uh, meditations he was talking about death and he said you know death is just a natural part of the world and and you know to so you it's just something natural it's just something that happens and so to fear something natural makes you a child you know and so and that that i i feel the same way about our food supply. And this is not, this is nature and this is natural. And this is what we are supposed to do. This is what is in our nature to do. And this is what provides us with the best health to develop uh, to our, our best potential, to live our best and most healthy life, to live as long as we can in a healthful way and to provide our children, our family members and our parents with the best life possible as well. And that is our nature. And to deny that is childish because it's it's not going to go away. It's also very foolhardy because you will suffer for it. It's not, it's not, you can't just get an equivalent with 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 uh plants, even with supplementation. It doesn't work. There's actually a study with that. And um, I mean, obviously it's plain as day, you know, you have plants that have these different biotoxins that they make to harm you for if you eat them. So obviously that's going to cause harm. But you know, when you're not designed to eat something, it's it's not going to work properly in you. Uh, there was a study with the the Maasai in uh, 1931. It was published in JAMA, and their neighbors, the Akikuyu, who were genetically similar because they interbred, they intermarried. And uh, the Maasai, you know, just eat meat, blood, and milk. And uh, the Akikuyu are, are largely plant based, whole food plant based. This is back in the the 20s that they were studying these things, the 20s and the 30s. And so this is like a vegan's dream. You know, there's no pesticides, no fertilizers, there's no nothing. It's just just you know. Plants, plants that you get in just out in the wilds in Africa and that they will cultivate. And uh, and they found that the uh, Maasai were, adult males were five inches taller, 50% stronger, um, or sorry, twice as strong, and um, or something like 20, 28 pounds heavier of lean muscle mass. And they were much, much better health in, in every in every regard. Akikuyu were, uh, had you know, sort of bone deformities, uh, low bone density, they were anemic, they had all these uh, different sorts of health issues, dental issues, uh, they would get chest infections, they would get, you know, all sorts of different uh, nasty infections, uh, much more susceptible to them, and uh, they had a lot of uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And so they they tested that and they tried to like give them all the supplementation to catch them up with all the things that they were deficient in, and they found that it actually didn't didn't help their health at all. You know, they were still sick and they were obviously you're not going to change their development, but it wasn't until they started feeding them meat and taking away the plants. And so they replaced the plants with meat that they actually got healthy again. So, you know, it's not enough to just, just supplement. That's not good enough. And so if you want to do that to yourself, if you want to suffer, if you want to hurt yourself, that's your business. You don't get to do that to your kids and you don't get to push that on other people. It's absolutely out of bounds.
Yeah, I think that's one thing um, we talk about a lot on our podcast and just in general conversations, Tara and I really stand for food choice. So Mm -hmm. it's like, yes, I guess, you know, if that this is the way you want to run your household with, you know, whatever food purchasing habits it is, or, you know, food products it is, that's great. But, you know, we have the, we draw the line when, you know, people start wanting to push that out that like everyone has to eat that way. I mean, I, I'd be interested in your take on this, but I, I really find it hard to believe that there could be like one food um, diet that is across mm-hmm. the board, you know, healthy for everyone. Like, you know, there's, eight, what is it? 8 billion people on the planet now. And you're telling me that we should all be eating one exact same way. I just don't subscribe to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also, that's why like going back to kind of like, like the regenerative, co- you know, conventional conversation, um, you know, <laughs> we got to where we got in the food system because people wanted like, you know, affordable, safe food. Um, and as our food system, the way it's built right now, like the best in every aspect, no, but at the end of the day, we do have, you know, options for everyone to eat. Um, you know, at the end of the, I mean, we obviously still have, you know, food insecurity in the U S I don't want to like deny that reality. Um, but we're pretty fortunate to have the food system we do to be able to go to make the choices we want to. And so it's pretty hard to argue again, you know, with your stance too, like on the carnivore diet, it's pretty hard to argue. Like I am for, you know, the conventional grocery store beef on someone's plate that they can afford before I am them not putting the the meat there at all. So when we want to get into that, like regenerative grass fed only narrative, I'm like, well, again, I go back to food choice. If there's a family that doesn't, you know, can't afford it or doesn't maybe care about some of the values you do, or, you know, understand like at the end of the day, I am for like meat on the plate. Um, And unfortunately that involves kind of the conventional food system. If we want to do it widespread at an affordable, you know, price and at a very fast price too, like people who you want to take away your DoorDash. Okay. You want to take away all these the convenient food factors we have in America and go back to like, you know, buying, I'm all for buying for your local rancher. That's great. I'm all for shopping at the local farmer's market. You know, I used to do that when I lived in a big city, like some of these habits I absolutely support, but that changes a lot of the other things. Again, going back to like what we asked for and understanding like the consequences and the ripple effect that comes behind that. Yeah. And going to back to kind of your point about like the nutrition and the food choice and people making decisions. I think where I start getting really worried is looking at like these school systems. Like we have, you know, both the New York school system and the LA school system who are pushing more vegan options on our children. And I'm just, that is extremely, like, it almost feels like we're running a science experiment on our kids, which is terrifying that we don't know the full consequences of a, you know, plant-based diet. And some of these school systems, it's in my mind, I'm like, it's not like they're getting like an avocado or, you know, other like tons of really great nuts or legumes or what, you know, all these like whole foods, that's not what they're getting. And so we're removing one of the most nutrient dense things on their plate in these school systems and giving them a lot more, you know, calories with nutrient deficient you know, lots of carbs filling them up. And that really is a huge concern to me is when we're pushing these diets onto, to our children and we're not realizing the unintended consequences and, and we're removing nutrient dense foods from their, their plates. Going to back to the earlier conversation when you talked about, like, we're at this point of like this anti-meat narrative. And I do actually, I think we've hopefully seen the peak of it because I do think we are seeing vegans come out of the woodworks kind of saying like, sure, I felt great the first six months or the year or whatever it is, but we're starting to have that longer time span in that lifestyle where they're coming out to say like, I've been in it for seven years now. And the last four were actual hell. And, you know, so we're getting this narrative. And so going to what Tara said about the long-term effects of veganism, like I actually think the longer someone stays in veganism, the more detrimental it is. And we're starting to see them come out of it. And so to push it on our kids at such a young age um, and to do it so many years, you know, you're in the school system for 18 years. So if you're not going home and having a well-balanced meal, you're going to get a vegan lifestyle. That's like Tara said, a pretty crappy one at that, you know, for 18 years, like what's 18 years do to your body. If you talk to a lot of vegans, like they're out of it by that time. Like there's not a lot of 20 year vegans out there. I mean, I don't know, I guess I don't know the percentages, but I feel like a lot of them like break it, you know, at a certain point where Mm -hmm. they're like, sure. I felt great because I was making other lifestyle changes or because I was cutting some of the crappy food, but the longer I stayed in it, you know, the more detriment I had to my body because I was lacking those, you know, the amino acids I needed. I was lacking the protein, the macronutrients that I needed. Yeah. So it's actually 82% of vegans stop being vegan after a year. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite high. And, uh, and also Amy, it's more detrimental during, during development and kids that uh, you know, are, are going vegan, things like that. They have uh, the lower bone density, their shorter stature, um, and they have higher rates of autism as well. There was a study out of Oxford in 2008 that showed that people that went vegan uh, after five years and they checked with, with MRI 
that their brains actually shrunk by 5% plus. So they actually oh my gosh. the brain by volume. And we actually see this in, in neurosurgery as well. You can actually see uh, the difference in spinal cord uh, integrity uh, and, and, and brain as well um, in, uh, in mm -hmm. PC because their, their spinal cord actually atrophies after several years. Uh, one major reason for that is B12. Can I get B12 from a plant-based diet? And so not, and some people don't, don't uh, supplement enough. And actually, you know, uh, most people are chronically low on B12. We see this all the time. People have very low B12, but they don't even know it because the reference range is, uh, is, is similar in the U.S. and in, in Australia, sort of like 160 to 620, something like that, right? And so people will be in there like, oh, they're, you know, 250, 300, 400, something like that. Like, oh, okay, you're, you're right there in the middle of the range. And so most, most doctors will look at that and go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're fine. Well, below 400, you can actually get nerve damage and demyelination of your axons in your, in your brain cells and your, and your nerve cells. So you can actually see that demyelination and that thinning and narrowing of your spinal cord. So it's actually a very serious, uh, serious issue that people aren't, aren't understanding. And you're doing that to yourself as an adult, it will have serious consequences. You do that to a kid, it has a permanent impact on stunting their development. Yeah. And unfortunately I do feel like when it comes for, um, females, I do feel like that, um, the vegan diet or vegetarian can be used as a, um, oh, it's just restrictive um, eating. Yeah. Um, but what's that called? Why I not? Yes. Thank you. Um, yes. it's used as a cover for a di eating disorder. Um, it's been shown for females that it, you know, that way they could say that, oh no, I can't eat that because I, you know, and it, it's just oh, really yeah. sad when you step back and look at like, um, the health. Um, cause that's when it, it really, um, tears me up a little bit is when we see these younger generations, the teenagers or the, you know, early age college girls that are, um, you know, living this lifestyle and they don't really understand, I think like what's actually happening inside their bodies, the negative uh, relationship with food. Yeah. 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 I had a, I had a, a friend of mine I actually knew in, when I was in San Diego and she, she'd been bulimic for a while. And she told me that she sort of basically went to these a vegetarian sort of, you know, salad soup bars. And, and she said, the reason she did that was because the, the vegetarian food was uh, easier to throw up. And so she would eat that. She made a plate eating it and then she could throw it up and it'd be comfortable and get rid of it. And that was, that was easier for her. So uh, that was, I mean, that was, that was just one person, but um, it sort of fits with what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just wild. I think I've said this, but it just is wild. This is where we've got to with our food, mm -hmm. like our food system, our food sources and how we view the food that we're putting into our bodies. Yeah. So I'm Catholic. Um, and so we're in Lent right now. And so on Fridays we abstain from meat and I swear on Fridays, I'm like, I don't know what to eat. I don't know. I'm like, how does someone live this way all the time? I, for one, don't know what to eat. And then I feel like I, I truly do feel like I, um, cause I'm obviously not anywhere where like I'm sourcing like amazing seafood. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like I ate crappier that day. Like I just don't feel good that day. I'm like, oh great, Friday's back around. You know, I got to find something to eat that makes me feel good because I feel like I just snack on crap. And so it, it just, I always think, wow, how does someone live like this seven days a week, 365 days a year, X amount of years in a row? Yeah. You know, the more that I learn about like the carnivore diet, I'm not carnivore, but I've been learning more and more about it recently. And it's made me stop when I eat like whole foods, whether it's meat or vegetables and think about how it truly tastes to me. Um, not because I, this is something I saw a carnivore talk about is like your salad. How does it actually taste to you? You know, you talked about like the plant putting out like, you know, what, I don't know exactly what it is, but things that make it taste like bitter or things so that as humans, we wouldn't want to eat it. And yesterday I was eating a salad and I was like, you know, if it wasn't for the dressing that I had poured all over the salad, I like, it would be, I'd be having a really hard time, like palatability wise eating these just whole lettuce. Uh, on the other hand, I had a great salmon and I, the salmon had like nothing on it. I mean, it was, I think it was probably cooked. I think it said it was cooked in like a lemon butter and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I just was like contrasting those two different things that like how on its own, like steak with it cooked in butter and, and maybe even maybe garlic, maybe a little salt and pepper, like very minimal things, how amazing it can taste to you versus like the salad that you're putting, like, you know, buttermilk ranch on it, or, you know, whatever, lots of different salad options. And just thinking about what those whole foods actually taste like to your palate at their core. 
Yeah, I think I think that's really uh, telling. You know, uh, why would we evolve to hate the taste of, you know, what we're supposed to eat, or or why were we designed and created to hate the taste of something that we're supposed to eat? That doesn't make any sense. You know, deer don't go around eating, you know, the crappy tasting leaves. And I've seen cows eat like really green grass. Their eyes are just wide. Yes, you know, like they they enjoy, they are really enjoying that. And so if you know, if you notice something bitter, I think that's a very good sign that that's something bad for you. Because our tongue and our brain are very sophisticated machines and they can identify harmful chemicals in there and they give that negative feedback saying, hey, this is bad for you, spit it out. You know, it's like a Mr. Yuck sticker, you know, spit it out. You know? <laughs> and so you just automatically do. You, and, and this is why kids say something go like, oh, no, that's, that's, that's not good for me. And, uh, and that's how you survive in the wild. That's how you survive sort of eating things. Oh, don't, don't want to eat that. And, um, and so I, I do think that's exactly what that is. I, I think that's, you, you're, you are identifying harmful things. And so if something is bitter, I think it is bad for you. Now, just because something is good for you doesn't necessarily mean it is good for you. Sugar and yeah, that's like the that. flip side of the coin. Yeah. Well, but it's, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's a drug. And we also have recognized, uh, you know, fructose as being safe because, you know, things that contain fructose, uh, are generally not acutely poisonous to us. Now, there, there can be some defense chemicals in them, like there are furanocumarins in citrus, all citrus, that can be quite harmful to you. And you have to detoxify, but there are much less toxins and defense chemicals in things that contain fructose. That's that's what people have decided is why we recognize uh, fructose as, as the sweetest of the carbohydrates. So this is something we recognize as safe. But it's also addictive. It also gives an addiction signal to the, um, you know, a dopamine signal to the addiction centers of your brain. And there have actually been MRI studies showing that uh, that sugar fructose kills the same areas of your brain as methamphetamines to the same extent as methamphetamines. And it actually is, is processed in your liver uh, into the same byproducts as alcohol. So you get the same damage to your body from sugar as you do alcohol. So this is a drug. This benefits the plant by getting you addicted to it. So you want to eat it. So you want to move its fruit but that doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's good for you, you know? Um, but if something, so that's an outlier, but there aren't, there aren't actually too many outliers on, on the good taste side of things. But if it tastes bad, then I think it's invariably, unless you're using something medicinally, that, that I think is, is your brain telling you there is something bad in here. Um, I did want to, I did want to sort of uh, mention you already talked about um, previously about how you, you didn't, you, you didn't think that, sort of everybody had like a, a same optimal diet. That, that's actually an argument that I've made was that, you know, humans, you know, should have an optimal diet that should be universal to us because we're one species, we're homo sapiens sapiens. And, you know, so we should have something that is good for all of us. Because if we had, if there was something different, then, then we should be different species because that, that is what you see in nature. And I can't think of any example in nature where you have two members of the same species that have different optimal diets. Now you can have better or worse suboptimal diets based on you know, your ethnicity and background. You know, there are people from European background and elsewhere that have had agriculture for eight to 10,000 years. And we would have more defenses built up against different sorts of things that we find in crops. And that, that is what we see, but we also see native prop populations like in uh, you know, Native Americans or Native Australians when eating a Western diet, they're four times as likely to develop obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the other sort of chronic diseases. And uh, when they don't eat those things, they don't get those diseases. And they used to call those the diseases of the West because we only saw those in Western populations. We didn't see these in these indigenous populations that were just living these hunter-gatherer, Stone Age, nomad sort of lives. And then they started eating the Western diet and they started getting the Western diseases. And so that's another argument I've made that, that these so-called chronic diseases that we treat nowadays as a mainstay in medicine are not really diseases per se, but just a, a consequence of, of eating outside of our species specific nutrition. And, and just like you know, any zoo people will tell you and, and any rancher can tell you, you feed an animal something that it's not supposed to eat, it can get very sick. And if your cows get into, into a short patch, they run out of you know, their normal pastures, they start eating plants that they normally wouldn't, they get very, very sick. And I think that's actually happening to us as well. But I would actually think that just biologically, we should have an optimal diet. And I think meat is definitely it. And you know, we get all of our nutrition from that. 
and we don't get and that and that doesn't come along with a lot of defense chemicals that plants use. I mean, plants make around a million different chemicals, most of which are used to stop poison, or kill, or disrupt animals and insects from eating them. You don't you don't have that in a, in an animal because yes, the animal doesn't want to die either, but it has other defenses. It can kick you, it can run away, it can you know nail you with its horns. A bull can come after you and just stomp you. So it has other defenses. It doesn't need to be physically poisonous to you. And so I think that that inherently is going to be, uh, you know, our, our most optimal food source. Yeah. I think that's really good perspective. I think that I, I like the idea of like the sub, I forget how you said it exactly, but like me or animal protein is at the top. Then there are subs, like even within dairy, we see that, that there are certain people that are better able to digest dairy based on how long it's been a part of their history. Um, so there's certain cultures that digest dairy easier and there's other cultures that have a very difficult time. Um, and I guess not just cultures, but ethnicities that uh, are able to digest dairy or not because of how long it's been a part of their culture they're acceptable foods yeah well even even uh in mongolia you know they like you know genghis khan the mongol horde like they were they were carnivores and they ate horse meat drank horse blood and fermented mare's milk and so they had they had a lot of dairy products but they fermented all of them and so they're actually horribly lactose intolerant and even to this day like they they, they can't deal with lactose they're, they're they're very lactose intolerant and um but they still drink a lot of dairy but it's, but it's all that fermented dairy. So you can still use this stuff and, yeah. uh, and, and it have been for quite some time. It just sort of sort of processes it a bit differently. Yeah. The fermented dairy is, I don't know, we won't go down that rabbit hole, but it's just really cool to see the health benefits and just how dairy has been used. Um, and so, I mean, wide variety of ways. There's a new, um, oil company out that is a fermented oil that I think is pretty mm -hmm. interesting. Oh, interesting. What's that? Um, it's called Zero Acre Farms. I actually just listened to them on a podcast the other day. They were obviously talking about seed oils and stuff, but yeah, they just, um, I don't know if they patented or the original, I mm. do not quote me on any of that, but they're definitely, uh, very first are in the fermented oil. So is that fermented seed oils then? Um, yes, I believe mm. so because he, well, um, I don't know what he's actually pulling from. I mean, he talked about, basically he was talking about how he, um, wanted to fix seed, right? So he recognized this problem in the seed oil industry and mm -hmm. he kind of went to avocado oils and coconut, um, coconut oil, but realized like if he's going to compete with, you know, canola oil, um, there's just not a big enough supply to do it. So I believe it is probably a fermented seed oil, but I guess I must've tuned out that part of the, part no. of the podcast. No, I definitely just... know they're fermented though. It's zero acre farms. Okay. Yeah. We'll look it up. Yeah. It might maybe they figured out another way of processing these seed oils. So instead of like the big industrial manufacturing sort of things and dumping in, you know, the different mm -hmm. bleaches and things like that. And maybe, maybe they're fermenting it and you get, get a better product that way. That'd be nice. It'd be, it'd be, mm -hmm. Uh, fun if they did sort of figure out how to use that that uh, you know that product better you know because it's a, you know it's a resource that that could very well you know be useful in many ways and uh, just just uh, you know maybe not to eat you know well yeah maybe. <laughs> unless it's fermented <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it could be yeah it could very well be. and that'd be great you know they just have yeah. there's more options you know I'm, I'm I'm all for having options you know I just I just want them to be you know good healthful options and um, and uh, I think it's just, you know, and, and I certainly don't want, you know, some of the best options that we have, which is, you know, meat and dairy to be vilified wrongly and unfairly, you know, because the, these are like the most important, you know, uh, nutrient sources that we have. And, um, you know, and people are, are, you know, being, doing real harm by vilifying these things. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you both so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think we've been talking for about an hour and a half there. So <laughs> maybe we'll uh, wrap it up. But um, how do people get a hold of you and uh, and find you online and, and find your podcast and support your work? 
Yeah, we would love if you'd hop over to our podcast. It's Discover Ag and it's available anywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, basically, what we do is break down kind of trending topics in the ag and food space each week. So if you want, you know, a farmer's perspective of things that are going on that you see, whether it's, you know, environmental, like we're talking kind of about the flooding that's going in California and what that means for the food system. And we've talked about like Bill Gates investing in seaweed and like the future. And so just really anything that has to do with the food and ag space, we we break it down. We talk about it and what it means, you know, from two millennial female farmers perspective. So we have a lot of fun and we would love if you guys would hop over to discover ag. Lovely. And, and what are your uh, social media handles for people to find you? Yeah, you can find us on social media at our personal pages at Tara Vanderdusen and at Natalie Kovark. And you can also find discover ag at discover ag underscore. Perfect. Great. Well, we'll put all those links in the description as well. So people can, just, can stroll down and, and find those and, uh, and hopefully check out your podcasts and your pages. So uh, Natalie Taro, thank you both so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks yeah, for having thank us on. You. This is great. No problem. Hope to do it again sometime. Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys. Mm -hmm.